All right. Hello, friends. It is the Cozy Representative, your online uh, 2000s emo history liaison. How you doing? So, friends, answer me this. What do you get when you combine the musical creativity and boldness of a band like Gatsby's American Dream? Catchy high school emo punk infectiousness of Fall Out Boy. Add a cup of like vaudevillian influence and some burlesque dancers from the 1920s, as well as a few heaping spoonfuls of techno ish, uh, outside the box electronic influence. Oh, and like a dash of steampunk in there. You, that's right, you get 2005's A Fever You Can't Sweat Out by Las Vegas's own Panic at the Disco. Legendary, legendary, nothing short of legendary. <laughs> I'm gonna need you to keep tight, come on, just snap, snap, snap your fingers for me Good, good, now we're making some progress, come on, just tap, tap, tap your toes to the beat Signs to Fall Out Boy's Pete Wentz's record label, Decadence Records, Panic at the Disco, in a lot of ways, took a lot of the groundwork which had been built by emo slash pop punk bands in the underground world in the early 2000s. Bands like Armor for Sleep, Motion City Soundtrack, Fall Out Boy, May, uh, all that kind of stuff. They built on it, evolved it boosted it up with new layers and truly unique musical experimentation, exploring waters which had until then been totally uncharted, uh, you know, for your average emo slash pop punk band at the time. <laughs> They made a great first record in the process and unintentionally brought the whole genre they were a part of to new heights. The game really wasn't the same following Panic at the Disco's arrival. With their cinematic circus-themed stage show with burlesque dancers to boot, paired with the bold, undeniable ambitiousness of their first record, they showed the world that an emo pop-punk band from the Warp Tour world could be absolutely larger than life. <laughs> Kind of like I was saying, every other band in the scene had to compete at a higher level once Panic at the Disco showed up. Uh, while I do love Panic at the Disco and their music on their first record and that whole era of the band, uh, you know, I grew up a very, very big fan of them, I do think that Panic and the Fever record specifically was a huge factor in causing the 2000s emo pop punk movement uh, to go from more of an underground thing in small clubs, a more DIY grassroots kind of vibe with those older bands I was mentioning, uh, to turning into almost an 80s hair metal arena kind of thing where emo bands were all of a sudden on MTV and performing with Rihanna and some people had become millionaires. Because of the scene becoming overblown and oversaturated in the mainstream around 2008 or 2009, it eventually became tired and uh, ultimately died out around 2010 or so. Oh yeah! And, without knowing it, <laughs> I think that the young teenage 2005 Panic at the Disco completely accidentally made a record that would literally change the entire course of the emo and pop punk movement of which they were a part of, for better or for worse. But, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Hello, my name is The Cozy Representative, and this right here, my friends, is exploring Panic at the Disco's A Fever You Can't Sweat Out era. Let's go! So, uh... There's so many things you can say about performers, but sometimes uh, the best judge of how much you like a band is how jealous you are of the songs they've written. And uh, <laughs> these kids, we're, we're very jealous of the songs they've written. They're our best friends, and we're happy to have them part of our gang. Ladies and gentlemen, from Las Vegas, Nevada, Panic at the Disco. 
Well, imagine as I'm facing the peers in a church corridor. I can't help but to hear, no, I can't help but to hear an exchanging of words. What a beautiful wedding! What a beautiful wedding since the bridesmaid, too. Oh, yes, food, what a shame! What a shame the poor groom's bride is a whore. So the origins of the famous Panic at the Disco go all the way back to the early 2000s when the members were, you know, 14, 15 years old in high school. It's a pretty standard story of how most high school bands formed. Uh, originally, Brendan Urie was not yet in the picture. It started out with Ryan Ross, who sang and played guitar. Uh, he linked up with his high school friend Spencer Smith, who played the drums, and they started jamming together in the ninth grade, freshman year of high school. Eventually, they brought in... Uh, uh, a young man named Brent Wilson, who went to a different high school to play bass and also rounded out the lineup with a singer named Trevor. Uh, this band was called the Summer League. Great name for a high school band. Uh, <laughs> and while there are no actual recordings of the Summer League out there, I have reason to believe, based simply on what this band looked like, their outfits, and the fact that they were a high school pop punk band in the early 2000s, that they probably sounded exactly like Blink-182 or Sum 41, uh, maybe some MXPX in there, you know, that kind of influence. I don't want this responsibility. Now, once the year 2004 rolled around, uh, the band members were now around juniors and seniors in high school, and they still enjoyed playing music together, but as they were getting older, their musical tastes and influences started evolving, expanding, maturing, fueled by the fact that they felt that the local Las Vegas music scene that they were a part of was filled with bands who were too monotonous and uninteresting. Apparently, there's a lot of heavy uh, music around them, which they just weren't really vibing with, uh, the young lads wanted to form a new project uh, which thought more outside of the box musically and was something more standout than not only that they had been doing, but also uh, more standout than they, th than they felt other people in the Vegas area in the scene at the time were doing as well. At this point, the Summer League vocalist, this guy Trevor, he's out of the picture. Ryan Ross was originally going to take on lead vocal duties, and Brent Wilson brought in his classmate, a young Brendan Urie, to play guitar and sing backup vocals. Now, uh, the band started practicing. They're there with Brendan. He's playing guitar. You know, they heard Brendan singing his backup vocals, practicing his backups, and I mean, come on, we all know this. That dude's voice, even back then, was undeniably good and distinct and stand out. He sounded a lot like Patrick Stump from Fall Out Boy at the time, but if anything, uh, this was a plus for the young band because they were huge fans of Fall Out Boy. So after hearing Brendan sing, they decided that Brendan should take on lead vocal duties, and Ryan stuck to just playing guitar and also being being the main songwriter. Now, this new group decided to call themselves Panic at the Disco, which came from a lyric from a song called Panic uh, by the super, super insanely underrated uh, emo pop punk group uh, called Name Taken off of their great 2004 full length Hold On. Panic at the Disco I supremely like recommend this album hold on I think it's if you're into like Bayside or like or like any Motion City soundtrack any sort of emo pop punk in the early 2000s like this record is for you this record's underrated man um the next part of our story takes place primarily on the website live journal which was sort of a blog slash early social networking kind of website, which was very popular amongst the youths in the mid 2000s, the emo youths. Uh, I don't know if I've ever really talked much about Live Journal on this channel, which is surprising because it was a very important and iconic website in the emo and scene MySpace world at the time. If you're my age, you, you might remember uh, FBR Trash or Fueled by Gossip. So, anyway, uh, flashing back to 04, Ryan Ross was kind of a hot shot on Live Journal at the time. Uh, there's a lot of really funny old uh, high school selfies which he took and uploaded to Live Journal, which are still floating around out there. There's also a lot of very, very humorously emo and poetic, you know, witty uh, kind of 2004 teenager blog posts on there, which I love. Those are also still <laughs> floating around, unfortunately for Ryan. I got, I got the emo. So 
So along with promoting their band and sharing their progress on LiveJournal, Ryan Ross and Panic at the Disco, that is, uh, they also posted some early demos of theirs onto the website Pure Volume. These early demos were mostly electronic and or kind of acoustic based, which apparently was due to the fact that the band did not have the resources to get into an actual studio, but Ryan Ross had apparently gotten GarageBand on his laptop at the time, uh, which was, you know, crazy revolutionary uh, in 2004. So they were able to make these stripped down electroacoustic demos at home. The band apparently did intend to keep the electronic elements within the music once they entered a real studio and started playing as a full band, but they would just add real drums and electric guitars to, to beef it up, which they couldn't yet do at home for the demos. In fact, on, on their early MySpace page uh, from around this time, it's there's a part where it says they're like, hit us up because we're looking for a fifth member to play keyboards or whatever. I guess it, that didn't work out. So these demos, which Panic had made at the time included early versions of songs like Nails for Breakfast, Tax for Snacks. Time to Dance was in there. Tommy Sado as well. Now, these demos were obviously very, very wholesome, I want to say. Very charming. Uh, they remind me of those gigantic desk computer monitors that everyone had at the time. And... AIM and like Windows 94 and like Club Penguin tutorials. That's what these demos just sound like to me. They just radiate that. <laughs> Regardless, despite these demos being obviously very lo-fi and a little bit rough around the edges, they were still totally very unique and attention grabbing and original and different than most bands uh, coming out around that time. I mean, this was, you know, 2004, early 2005. So, you know, it was all bands like Story of the Year and like Yellow Card and, and stuff like that. These early Panic demos were very forward thinking when compared to those types of bands at the time, in my humble opinion. And long story short, what basically ended up happening was through the Live Journal website, Ryan Ross apparently sent these early Panic demos to Pete Wentz. Uh, you know, like I said, Panic were very big Fall Out Boy fans at the time, and Fall Out Boy were, you know, blowing up in the underground off of the uh, Take This to Your Grave record uh, during that time. Uh, and there had also been like talks, rumors that Pete was intending to start his own record label soon, uh, which would eventually later materialize as Decadence Records, which used to be a subsidiary off of Fueled by Ramen. We're going to get to that in just a second. So after hearing about Pete's future label plans, Ryan hit him up on LiveJournal with the demos and uh, not thinking that he was going to even look at them or hear them or whatever. But on a whim, by some strange twist of fate, you know, the stars aligned, and Pete Wentz clicked on the demos, listened to them, and apparently was just blown away by them and loved what he heard, loved Brendan's voice, loved the songwriting, loved the, the forward, the unique vibe of the songs. It was then that he sent Ryan Ross a message on AOL Instant Messenger telling him that he loved the demos and he was interested in, in driving down to Vegas uh, to check them out and meet them in person and, and discuss possibly signing them to his new label and the rest was history really uh, and it sounds crazy now thinking about not you know how big Fall Out Boy became and how big Panic became too but it really did just start with some techno garage band demos a live journal account and uh, correspondence over AIM <laughs> so the next segment of this video is all quoted from an article uh, which is called Decadence Records an oral history told by Pete Wentz Travi McCoy Gabe 
support us, Spencer Smith, and more. Written, uh, put together by Marianne Eloise for publication The 45. It was published in November of 2020. This is a fantastic oral history for anybody who's interested in Decadence Records. I'll put a link to it in the description because I think this oral history is just fantastic. I'm going to read to you the section of, of this oral history where Pete and Travi and Gabe, those people are from Gym Class Heroes and Cobra Starship, respectively, and Spencer from Panic at the Disco, all describe the moment in time where Panic became the very first band actually signed to Pete Wentz's label Decadence. That's right. I don't know if I mentioned that yet. That's very important. Panic were the first band on Decadence. And, he, you know, here's all of these dudes' words, like, from their perspective at the time, which is not only very, very interesting to hear them reflect back on this time now, uh, but also you know, these guys can say this stuff way better than I could ever piece it together because they were like their part of it. So here's that section from this oral history. Pete Wentz, uh, when I came across Ryan Ross and Panic at the Disco, that was the real inception of the Decadence label. We were like, this needs a home. This is some strange shit. All those original Decadence bands were hard to place, and Fall Out Boy had had a lot of experience with submitting our stuff to labels and being told we didn't fit. I thought if I ever managed a band, I would do the opposite of that. You want to water a seed rather than tell it to be a different kind of flower. Spencer Smith then chimes in with a haven't you sorry that was that was that was a bad joke I, I'm, I'm I drink too much coffee okay and then I come up with bad jokes Spencer says at that time it was within six months of us meeting Brendan we had three demos that we foresaw being recorded fully with live drums but we didn't have the ability to do that so I think Ryan just had garage band which was revolutionary at the time we put these versions of the songs on pure volume the soundcloud of the era and then we posted that link in Pete's live journal hoping either fans would click on it or that he would ask us to go on tour. He actually listened to it and used AIM to reach out to Ryan. Pete says, I drove to Vegas because maybe I was terrified to fly at the time. Uh, I can't remember totally, but I met the Panic guys. They had a practice space and didn't even really know how to totally play the songs. They had all these electronic elements and they were like playing them acoustic, but it was clear that there was a thing. Travi McCoy says, I was with Pete when we met them in Vegas and they hadn't even played a show yet. They had to get their shit together real quick. Spencer says it turned out he was wanting to start an imprint or his own label and was looking for an artist to sign. Fall Out Boy was in Los Angeles recording Cork Tree and I was in high school. Fall Out Boy was our favorite band in the scene for a few different reasons and I remember telling my parents that Pete from Fall Out Boy had reached out and liked these demos and was going to come to the practice space. My parents were like who's Fall Out Boy? Pete says there was always a big outsider energy. We fit in together but maybe Maybe not anywhere else. Uh, there were some bands that people in the present didn't get, but when they look back, they're like, I got that. I'm like, A Fever You Can't Sweat Out was recorded with no money. It was insane. We didn't have a budget. If people say they got it right away, that would be insane. Travi says the demo was so fresh and the sound was so new. They were mixing pop punk with all these electronic beats and shit. And I was like, whoa, you need to hop on this for real. He ended up signing it. Uh, Spencer says we then had to drive to California to a really shitty studio called Love Juice Labs. And it was just horrible. Uh, but we recorded an actual version of Time to Dance for a Fueled by ramen compilation. We spent the back half of my senior year not caring about school and just writing, and the week after I graduated high school, me and Brendan got in a van and drove across the country to record the album. Jonathan Daniel, I believe from Crush Management, says, I remember Pete being super excited about Panic, even though they only had two songs on pure volume. Once they made the album, we all got excited, and I remember thinking, this will probably sell 50,000 copies. I was only off by about three million craziness. So the band gets signed to Pete Wentz's record label, Decadence Records. And like I was saying, Fall Out Boy weren't like super mega famous yet uh, when Pete first found Panic, but they were recording Cork Tree. Uh, and once Panic's album ended up coming out in late 2005, Fall Out Boy had 
already started to blow up and take over mainstream radio with, you know, singles like Sugar Were Going Down and Dance Dance uh, after Cork Tree had been released in April of that year, 2005. And basically, because Panic got signed to what ended up very quickly turning into a pretty big label in the scene with a lot of hype, it was a big deal, uh, you know, be because of Fall Out Boy being a big deal, a lot of people on the internet and in the scene were actually pretty mad at the time that Panic got signed so quickly uh, before before ever actually having played that many shows, possibly they didn't even play any shows before really getting signed. They had never toured. They only had those three or four pure volume demos. Uh, going from literally just starting, you know, to getting Pete Wentz's stamp of approval almost instantly made it possible for Panic to basically skip over a lot of steps that most bands have to go through when it comes to starting out and, you know, making your thing happen. Panic at the Disco didn't, you know, grind it out for years years eating shit in a van for no money uh trying to make their thing happen like so many bands in the scene were at the time you know they did that eating shit in a van for like two tours before they themselves took after fall out boy and blew up in the mainstream too i mean if you look at it that way panic at the disco were kind of industry plants at the time if you consider pete wentz in 2005 the industry but at the same time you 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 really can't say that though and have it fully be true uh you know pete wentz wasn't the industry uh his band was just happening to blow up around that time he didn't know that decadence records and fall out boy were we're gonna have the crazy mainstream success that it did you know panic got signed right before that happened uh if anything you know, Panic at the Disco were literally just in the exact right place at the exact right time, surrounded by the exact right people, and it helped that they really did have a damn good record on their hands. It was more of a freak of nature, a random, cosmic, uh, unexplainable, just stars aligning thing that turned into this huge cultural explosion. You know, that's what happened. It, 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 to me, it wasn't like skeevy industry happenings, you know what I mean? It really is a, a, a wild story. That being said, a lot of other bands and fans and people in the scene, you know, people were jaded back then, man. People were, people were like, you gotta pay your dues, like, people were a lot more, like, I don't know, punk and elitist, it, like in the emo scene. So a lot of people actually saw Panic as like total hacks or something from the jump just because of how quickly things were able to happen for them. Uh, you know, when, like I said, most bands have to grind it out for years, you know, punk rock sleeping in basements. Um, so people weren't sure about Panic at first, you know? So before we get into the Fever record itself and the impact that it had on not only the band themselves, but the, you know, the scene where they came from, I want to take a sec to go through uh, the touring history of Panic at the Disco throughout the Fever You Can't Sweat Out album cycle, not only is it interesting to me, um, and there are a lot of seriously you know, crazy, amazing tour lineups, uh, which they were on, which are wild to look back on today. Uh, but if we look at the tours that they were on in chronological order, I put them all together. It's very telling of exactly how fast and how no joke quickly things started rocketing and blowing up, uh, and, you know, getting absolutely insane for the young scene darlings panic at the disco. So their first tour, uh, was called the take cover tour headlined by the band acceptance. They had a song called take cover great band, by the way, acceptance. Also on the tour was Cartel, Augustana, The Receiving End of Sirens, and Panic at the Disco in the opening slot. That's in order from headlining to opening. Uh, and this was in August uh, and September of 2005. <laughs> Yeah, that, that Panic record was like a, a, like something I had and I don't think have ever witnessed. Like we were on tour with them and there was like these weird moments that would happen where in like hindsight you look back and be like, oh, that was a band about to get huge. So even on our first night, I had heard the record, like Squiz sent me the first mix of the record. I was like, this record is super good. Yeah. I don't know like if people are going to get into it, but it's super good. And the singers like crazy. The lyrics are great. Um, in the first night, I remember we were in Baltimore 
and uh, Panic played, and there weren't like, there were maybe 15 girls there for them. But each of the girls had made their own Panic shirt <laughs> and like a sign. Yeah. A sign. Like, that's a, like that is a thing you do. Uh, and, and I was just thinking, I was like, there's, all, there's like maybe 500 people here for us, and there's 15 there for them, but no one's ever made like a shirt and a sign for us. And I was like, mm-hmm. that's just, just like, there's a different thing happening. And then slowly throughout the tour, it was just like more and more shirts and signs and less and less weird guys with beards. Um, <laughs> and you knew, like, by the time we got to Chicago, it was, like, sold out in advance, 800 people. And, like, they went on, and it was just, you know, teenage girls everywhere, which was not our, that was not our demo. Um, oh, I knew there was kind of, like, some sort of undercurrent had, had taken over. It was a trip, man. That's wild. Well, they went from, they went from opening for that tour which they had booked, you know, months and months in advance. And it was like a pretty long, it was an extensive tour. I think it was like 30 or 45 days. So, you know, on the, the first date, they were still relatively unknown, but it mm. happened so fast. Yeah. By the last date of the tour, they, by all, by anyone's account, should have been headlining the shows, but mm-hmm. they were billed as the opener. And, it, you know, that, that's the spot they were in. And I remember it was like a week Oh, it was either like they did a one-off on an off day or like the next week and they played to a bigger room than we had played the entire tour and they had sold it out on their own. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh man, it was just crazy watching it happen. It was also like, it was also like, I think a pers- perspective for us to know that like we are not built to be a band that our band is not going to do something like that. Yes. That was reality right then and there, that tour. Yeah, because like, you still think it's like, oh, we could be big, and then you watch, then you watch what hap- what it's, then you watch firsthand what happens when a band like becomes big overnight, and you're like, oh, that's what that's what getting big looks like. That's not happening for us. <laughs> yep. You needed more we, vests. That was, I think, the key. We tried. We tried. It was I bad, tried to flat bad. iron my hair, but it just <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Next, they went out on the, get this, the Nintendo Fusion Tour, uh, an arena tour headlined by, (laughs) this is their second tour, an arena tour headlined by Fall Out Boy uh, with the starting line, Motion City Soundtrack, Boys Night Out, and again, Panic at the Disco in October and November of 2005. There were a bunch of kids there, even though, like, obviously there wasn't as much for Fall Out Boy, but there were a bunch of kids in there. They got them in pretty quick, and they were awesome. Like, it's weird. With this tour, the kids see us as, like, like a lot differently than the last tour. Me and Ryan were talking about it. Like, on the Acceptance Tour, we, you know, we were the opening band, and there was, like, 200 kids to see us. Now we're the opening band. We're, like, we're playing up to, like, 7,000 people. So, like, the kids see us as, like, a bigger band than we actually are. It's kind of funny. But then... You see our uh, van out there and you realize the truth, so. (laughs) They, I took the holidays off and then in late January of 2006, they went out to the UK on the Ambitious Ones and Smoking Guns tour, which was the Academy Is, Panic at the Disco, and the Junior Varsity. Next, uh, kind of a continuation of that tour, back to the States again with the Academy is headlining on the Truck Stops and State Lines tour, which was the Academy is headlining tour for almost here. Uh, the lineup was the Academy is Panic at the Disco direct support right before the Academy is. So like third or fourth tour, they already went from opening small slot to right before, you know, the headliners. Uh, and then opening for both of them was Acceptance and Hello Goodbye. And this was in February and March of 2006. Sit 
Next, in the spring of that year, they did Give It a Name Festival in the UK and Bamboozle in the States, uh, as well as some other festival dates during that time before heading out on their first headliner in the, the summer of 06, them headlining, and this lineup is really cool, with openers The Dresden Dolls, OK Go, and The Hush Sound. Boy, you'll ever be you and me, and then that fall they went out on the nothing rhymes with circus tour which was another headlining tour of theirs probably the most one of the most iconic tours they've ever done uh openers were jack's mannequin and the plain white tees like i said this was in fall of 06 and on this tour this was like the big tour we're gonna get into it in a second but this was when they were really blowing up and uh, like for real for real and they brought out a freaking circus bro like there was there were there were burlesque dancers doing dance routines that you know there was a whole Cirque du Soleil whatever kind of background there was like a windmill and all this crazy stuff <laughs> And uh, yeah, you said that it's important to be all part of a whole. And uh, when we look at your website, we look at uh, we're going to look at your videos, your music, your look. Everything seems to fit perfectly. Uh, and you're bringing that on tour with you with a vaudeville circus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whose idea was it to bring them with you? It's just Spencer's, really. <laughs> yeah. uh... No, it was it was all of our idea. Um, we have like a giant windmill as well, like a 12 foot tall windmill and, and the moon with a hanging mustache. moon with a mustache. And like we just designed like a set and then we decided that it'd be cool to kind of take the people that we'd met and, and that were in our first video and um, incorporate them into the show. Because I don't think, I haven't seen very many uh, rock bands doing anything like that in a long time. So. It's exciting. There's a lot of people on stage at the same time, so it's pretty. It's a lot going on, a lot to see, but it's fun. Like Moulin Rouge has kind of got a big influence on this tour and stuff, and uh, just that whole era, you know, anything within that like early 1900s. I don't know. It's really fascinating. Um, I don't know. Recently, I like looking at the expressions on people's faces when we have like the performers come out and they're doing their thing, and just people's like jaw dropped, like just staring, and it kind of makes it seem like it's all worth it, you know? And it's a lot of fun and it's really exciting for us to do that. Kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about Panic being a band showing that you can be, you know, come from the emo pop punk world, but do something larger than life that no one had ever really seen. This was a, a great example of that. I mean, I think My Chemical Romance were the only other band really doing like this level of, you know, theatrical uh, intensity. Um, but, you know, I think when Panic did it, it was it was you know something even more even more different and crazy and off the wall and it and it, it on a whim it worked you know what I mean somehow it worked all the stuff that Panic were doing all the circusy stuff it it could have people could have just been like this is weird you know but it worked and it's crazy so let's backtrack for a second shall we I want to get into the chart history of a fever you can't sweat out for a minute because you know. I mean, everything about this band is strange <laughs> in this time, and it's no different for the sales trajectory that this record had. It's a great example of an album which the band and the label that they were on really had no realistic idea how well or not well it was going to do. So the album was released on September 27th of 2005. Uh, apparently, according to my research, it debuted at number 112 on the Billboard 200 with around 10,000 copies sold within its first week. Week of release, which is modest, uh, but uh, that's 
way more than I think they were expecting for like a brand new band on their first record. Um, in early 2006, I write sins, not tragedies, you know, the classic was released as a single and, you know, the iconic circusy music video started blowing up, causing the album sales to rocket to a total of 500,000 copies around that point, like spring of 06, achieving gold status. Uh, at that point, ac according to Matt Squire, who produced the record, apparently it, it was selling like 30, 35,000 copies a week. Uh, according to Billboard, it spent a total of 69 weeks on the chart. That's a good number. Uh, it ended up peaking at number 13 almost a full year after the record was released on August 5th of 2006, right around the time when the band was headed out on the Nothing Rhymes with Circus tour. Uh, it was also around this time in August of 06 that the record was certified platinum with sales of a million copies. They landed themselves on the cover of Rolling Stone before Fall Out Boy did. That's a true thing. That's hilarious. I bet Pete Wentz was looking at that Rolling Stone cover like, I made you, Ryan Ross. <laughs> Fall Out Boy ended up on the cover too not long after, but anyways, to get a good perspective of what exactly the vibe was internally uh, within Panic's camp uh, and from uh, their label Fueled by Ramen's uh, perspective during this wild period of Panic absolutely blowing up, I wanted to to quickly share with you guys a segment of a podcast interview. This is a clip of Johnny Minardi, who was a very important guy in the world of old school, uh, you know, the classic Fueled by Ramen era. He worked for the label during that time and worked very closely with bands like The Academy Is and Panic and Gym Class and all that. This dude's like a big reason why a lot of those bands were even signed in the first place. Fun fact, you know that the Academy Is song Down and Out, you know the line, uh, we won't forget Tony or Johnny. Oh, 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 this is that Johnny. That's they were talking about this guy, Johnny Minardi. He was their friend. We won't forget Tony and Johnny. Oh, oh, no how they miss us, we still wish us the best on the So here is Johnny Minardi being interviewed by two members of the band The Main, actually, for their podcast, the 8123 podcast, uh, a couple years ago, where Johnny Minardi reflects on the Panic record being released, uh, it blowing up, uh, his perspective, uh, as well as a really funny and interesting story about a crazy experience he had uh, while working at Fueled by Ramen involving that first Panic record uh, during the, the, the week it came out. Uh, super interesting to hear, so check it out. When that when that panic record like like st started to explode, did it? Right. Was it hard to to keep up? Like, oh my god, dude! Literally, yes, because that record we had no idea how many records to make because the band had never released a song before for sale, you know. And that was I think it was before iTunes. Yeah, it had to be because yeah, we were doing so many physical units at the time and it was web store and distribution and tour or whatever but yeah that panic record dude like we didn't know what it was going to be because all you could judge is like myspace stats but we didn't know how that translated to sales because they hadn't released no, they didn't release an ep they came out of the gate with the full length so we had no idea what to do and that is the week the week of release john went to italy to get married and have his honeymoon for two weeks right at the beginning of it and this was my first <laughs> release there was like a gm right above us and then but he was a kid too he was just he wasn't like you know he'd never seen anything like it and i was the retail guy so that was the first record that came out and i don't know what we pressed we pressed twenty thousand units or something you know nothing crazy crazy by the standard of what you think that band is and we got a call from best buy i want to say at noon on the east coast and they said we're sold out of everything we need more and we and it was like three hours into the doors being open and that was on the east coast shit. and we were like <laughs> oh shit and i was like and I'm the guy. I have to be the guy that's that orders more. But John's overseas. The time difference. He's not. He's not awake right now. So I have to. <laughs> I have to. That everyone at our distribution company is like, you have to green light like fifty thousand copies of this like today in order to get them in the stores by the end of this week. And I'm like, I can't. That's so much money. Like I can't make. I can't make that call. I'm like, dude, this is literally in your hands. You have to figure it out. And I'm like. There's no possible way I'm making this call. So I had to call. We had just started working with Atlantic Records on like a friend basis while they were figuring out whatever, you know, subsidiary thing would happen. So I made a weird cold phone call over to there and just said, hey, I'm in a really weird pickle. I need this to be figured out. 
I'm the guy. I feel like I'm going to get fired if I do this because if I do it and we don't sell any, I'm fucked. And management's like calling me and asking me when I'm green lighting it. Is everything cool? And then the guy's just like, you'd be insane not to. You have to do it. Trust me. It's fine with the numbers they're reporting right now. Like you're fine, and I ultimately did it. So it doesn't sound as scary knowing what the band is now. But, yeah, but like, no. but like, what if their East Coast following was just crazy? Yeah. And then here I am, like quadrupling the order with a button, you know. And it kind of it worked out, obviously. But it was a it was like a two hour period where I was like, I'm not ma- equipped for this. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this this is above my pay grade, and my boss isn't here. I don't know what to do. And it was one of, that I was need the an moment. Adult. Dude, I was, yeah. And I literally did that and called Atlantic and they were like, done, you have to do it right now. Don't wait any longer. You'll screw it, screw it up, you know? So, um, but yeah, that was the moment that I was like, this is insane. And like, we're literally learning new things every day because you just have to make these crazy as educated as possible, but you know, they're crazy decisions. So yeah. you'd see that. I mean, even when Q is what we aim for came out, like again, that was all my space. So we're like, we don't know what this is going to be. And it, at the time, I think it came out right before panic and it like broke the record for the biggest fuel by ramen first week ever at the time. And it was like 13,000 copies or something, but that was such an wow. absurd number for a yeah, band. Yeah. And they did, I feel like they played a couple shows or I don't even remember where they were in the, but like at my space and MTV just like picked up on them somehow and it worked. So fever, you can't sweat out. At the time, a very, very, very strange record. It may not seem like it now, because this album obviously has turned into such an iconic emo classic. You could definitely consider it a genre-defining album uh, from this time period. And because of this, you know, for us elder scene kids or whatever, and really in the general, the people of the general population too, because Panic's kind of a household name at this point, um... You know, this album and these songs are so ingrained in us now, and so many bands did copy a lot of the unique new styles and innovation that Panic brought to the table on this album. So, with the perspective of time having passed and this record being so huge and such a staple, it looking back, it may not sound like that weird of a record now, but at the time, you know, the electronic influence in pop punk, the vaudevillian circus influence, the po- poetic, articulate, like really, really smart lyrics, which were all inspired by old classic literature and had really big words like surreptitious. Uh, This was stuff that nobody had really thought of doing before, especially specifically in the emo and pop punk world, which was already burgeoning and blowing up at the time. And this all just was like, what is going on here? It was totally weird and off the wall. It was polarizing at first. So the uh, I, I find really interesting. The record is split up into two halves, uh, like a side A and a side B. There's an introduction as track one, and the first half features uh, new versions of the three original demos that the band had had on live journal or whatever, plus some other ones. And the first half is way more in the style of those demos. It's more electronic influenced. Uh, those are the songs that sound a little bit more like Fall Out Boy or, uh, you know, other contemporary emo pop pop punk bands of the time. The real innovating thing about the first half of the record was the overt electronic influence. Now, the use of electronics was not a completely new addition to the genre by any means. You know, nerdy pop punk bands like Motion City Soundtrack had been utilizing Moog synthesizers long before Panic came into the picture. Uh, But Panic were, in my eyes, the first band to really go full throttle with electronic, or I should say the first emo pop punk band to really go full throttle with the electronic influence uh, with all kind of synths galore, drum machines, drum samples, which intertwine with real drums, you know, auto-tune on the vocals for the sake of the effect. Uh, Going this far into the electronic side of things hadn't hadn't been embraced this much on an album that was like this adjacent to emo or pop punk before this. Uh, And I think the first half of this record was very, very influential on the continuation of neon pop punk bands in the late 2000s, as well as uh, the emo and pop punk genre as a whole from then on out. It 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 was really a whole new world and a whole new way of doing things, which hadn't really been done or explored before, before Panic broke down the door with side one of Fever. The second half of the record... (laughs) 
<laughs> this is where things get freaky, my friends. So there, there's an intermission track in the middle of the album. Uh, it starts with like a techno beat, and then halfway through, there's like, there, you know, there's a voice that's like, uh, I forget what it says. It's like, there are problems with the programming. Uh, please enjoy regularly scheduled something or other. And then it changes to this like intense piano, kind of signifying that we're going into the analog. Uh, <laughs> section of the album uh and it goes right into the track but it's better if you do and from here on out the songs are what i can only describe as vaudevillian circus pop punk <laughs> <laughs> this had never ever ever been done before these songs were like a trip to the circus in the 1920s the second half of this album like i was saying in the beginning of this video it's like if the catchiness of fall out boy had a baby with the ambitious emo uh progressiveness of like gatsby's american dream or something and then that baby that fall out boy and gatsby's american dream had got a job working at a circus in like the 1920s and also really likes cigars and gambling and going to fancy strip joints where people wear weird elephant masks on their faces it's absolutely insane there's a good quote uh from matt Squire, who produced the record about why exactly the album was split up into two halves, uh, and how apparently if the band had had it their way, the whole record would have been like side two, a crazy weird vaudevillian baroque emo pop record. This quote was from a separate uh, reflective oral history about the record, which was uh, published in 2015 by Billboard. It's also pretty interesting. So Matt Squire says the vaudeville stuff was kind of all they wanted to do. By the time they got to the studio, they had this identity crisis. They didn't want to sound like Fall Out Boy. Uh, they, so they wanted to do all this Beatles-y shit. Uh, I took them out to lunch and said, why don't we tell the story of that creative evolution as the theme of the album? You guys are from Vegas and you did some dance shit. Now you're exploring new territory and that'll be the second half of the album. They didn't want to put the rock songs on the album. That was the only way I got them to, to agree to it. So that's pretty interesting. Like even that early on, they were already that ambitious and wanting to, to, to do something super different and already we're kind of thinking about wanting to do uh, some sort of Beatles-y kind of stuff, which is, you know, foreshadowing of, of, of what came later. But we're not talking about that today. I'll probably talk about that uh, at some point. But um, so yeah, and just fucking great songs, man. Side two of this album is like, something really special and cool i almost wish that the whole record sounded like side two um you know so many strings string sections orchestral stuff uh you know all sorts of like augs you know accordions and just craziness and 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 and, and also that paired with knowing that the record was made basically for no money very cheap very quickly uh for this pretty much unknown band at the time it's wild that the record sounds as big and as flourished as it does. Not to mention that they were all like 18. It really like, and everything about Panic! at the Disco during this time just boggles my, it doesn't make sense. It's very, very integral to note uh, that pretty much this whole record uh, was written by guitarist Ryan Ross. He wrote all of the wordy, intelligent, flowery, like classic literature inspired lyrics for the album, which shows that Ryan Ross was really wise beyond his years. I have no idea how a 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid wrote lyrics like these. It's genius. I, I really think Ryan was a genius. I really think he just had a gift. Ryan also wrote the majority of the music and the vocal melodies, too. Ryan was a real a real integral part of the whole vision and creative direction behind Panic! at the Disco, the way I see it. Uh, and him being the main songwriter, I'm just like, man, this kid Ryan Ross had a real gift at the time and wrote some real genius shit some shit that literally changed the fucking game like permanently <laughs> it would be irresponsible for me not to mention the fact that there was some drama during this time uh right before the band's first headlining tour i believe in the in the summer of 06 uh they kicked original bassist brent wilson out of the band uh according to them like i guess you know it seemed like the vibe were like he was their bro but like things were progressing so fast for the band and they really had to rise to the occasion and be really professional really quickly and i guess brent just like wasn't the best musician he wasn't really rising to the occasion he was uh you know according to them he was just like showing up late to shows or not showing up at all he might have been getting into some substances at the time they alluded to so 
and, and, and apparently overall he just wasn't really the best musician. Uh, so they gave him the boot uh, and they got this guy John Walker to fill in who he had actually been in a band called 504 Plan who were a part of like sort of the early 2000s uh, Chicago VFW Hall scene that Fall Out Boy and uh, the Academy is and the audition all came from the Plain White Tees. The 504 Plan were a band in that. And John Walker was in that band. And then he later went on to tour with the Academy is as a videographer. He was actually the original guy who did like the original TAI TVs. And then they got him to play bass for their their headlining tours. And he became their bass player uh, from then on out. And there was drama with Brent because uh, a lot of fans were sad about it. I guess they people liked Brent a lot. And, and uh, you know, th there, there was kind of some beef. Brent's family, uh, you know, his brother and girlfriend started posting stuff on MySpace like, fuck those degenerates and panic at the disco. You know, it was a money move. They, na 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 like they're, they're assholes. And then, and then Brent said stuff. And then Spencer Smith, the drummer, was like, oh, he didn't, he was, he was a horse horrible musician. He didn't even play bass on the record. That's what they said. They said he didn't even play bass on the album. I have no idea if that's true. He is credited on the album. I don't know if Spencer was just, you know, just, just talking crap, but, um, you know, over, it eventually resolved itself and people ended up really liking John Walker as the bass player. I do think that John Walker was kind of a, um, a good fit for the band and, and was very integral for the band's second album era. And, uh, you know, Brent Wilson, you know, he didn't, as far as I know, he didn't end up joining any other bands. Um, funny enough, I actually used to, <laughs> used to add people on Facebook and I've been his Facebook friend for a really long time. I, I've talked to him on, on Facebook chat before about like, we've talked about like every time I die just randomly. Um, and recently, like the the first headlines he's made since all the way back back here in 2006 um i he got arrested recently for like drug and gun charges uh you know which sucks i hope he's okay i don't know man that's that sucks you know so i so i hope brent wilson is doing well and i hope you know it's interesting to see all this drama back in the day but yeah so that happened. So anyways, guys, the last segment of this video that, that, that I want to get into, um, sort of the impact of Panic at the Disco on the scene, both positive and negative. Now, I, I've kind of been talking earlier, uh, or I was talking earlier about how things changed a lot in the scene after Panic hit and, and the, the scene itself that they were a part of, uh, you know, I mean, you had a lot of bands blowing up at the time. You had Fall Out Boy, Paramore, uh, you know, there were tons of bands, but Panic at the Disco specifically really brought things to a, to a new level. And um, I feel like, the, you know, I, I could sit here and try to, try to uh, paint a picture for you as best as I can, but I really want to play another clip uh, from another very interesting podcast with Adam T. Siska. He was the bass player of The Academy Is, and... Um, I actually, I think I might have played this same clip in a video that I made like two years ago about the Academy is, but I, I want to revisit it because uh, it, it, he basically talks about how Panic at the Disco were a huge factor in the demise and decline and eventual end of the Academy is like Panic at the Disco specifically kind of took the wind out of the Academy is as sales. Uh, sales metaphorically referring to a boat, but also literally referring to album sales. So I, I, I want to play this clip of him talking because I think it's a really good perspective and example of um, like the real internal impact that uh, Panic at the Disco had on the, the sort of just the vibe in the scene, because I don't think the Academy is were the only band that experienced uh, this kind of shift after the arrival of Panic uh, and, you know, the emo scene kind of turning into the superstar arena thing. So here's a clip of Adam T. Siska uh, talking about that. And I, I think this is really interesting. It totally like blew my mind when I heard it because I'm like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And it's crazy to crazy to hear now. So check this out. Do you want to say anything uh, nice about Brendan Yuri? Yeah, great guy. Really great guy. Um, one of the best, actually. Um, Panic, 
had a huge part in the downfall of the Academy is. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, here we go. Um, not anything they did in particular, but, you know, I've never talked about this publicly at all, so you're getting a... Uh, Spicy Insider taste. scoop. Whoever, whoever these four people, <laughs> yeah, if, if they're still four. All you idiots that were here uh, before and left, you didn't hear any of this. Um, <laughs> for like a year before, uh, before Pan- Panic at the Disco came out with the first record, like there was Fall Out Boy and there was The Academy Is, and the record label really loved us. We were their number two band, mm-hmm. and as soon as that band showed up, I, uh, we were playing in Vegas at this place called Jillian's, and. Uh, this guy Scott Nagelberg, who still manages Panic to this day, he came and he goes, "There's this band I might manage, and they want to meet you guys. Can they come in?" And we said, "Of course." So they came in the dressing room and they were like really nervous. And Brendan had these like thick frame glasses on. He looked kind of like Hillary Swank in Boys Don't Cry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Spencer was like baby fat. They were all just like really shy. Mm-hmm nervous so happy to be meeting us they liked the band and uh we kind of took them under our wing fall boy took them under their wing and that record came out we were in the uk and uh it came out big like i think when almost here came out it sold like 4500 copies the first week which is nothing by industry standards but for a first time record we were putting out you know it, it was good it was a good debut mm-hmm. Uh, Panic came out and sold 9,000 their first week. The scene had gotten bigger, and part of that was the groundwork that we had laid, you yeah. know, like the cadence it was beginning with that. And also, we weren't on Decadence. We were just on Feel by Ramen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Panic came out. They were the biggest fucking band in the world by the end of the year. <laughs> and we had them opening for us for a tour, and, and luckily, the tour sold out really quick, and I didn't feel like they were blowing us out of the water by any means. In the UK, I felt it a little harder because they were really, really big there. But in America, I thought our, the tour was great. And they were supposed to be the opener. It was going to be them, Hello Goodbye, Acceptance, mm. and us. And by the tour came, by the time the tour came, they were direct support and yeah. probably should have been headlining. Not probably, definitely should have been headlining. Wow. But because the tickets had been sold out for a while, no one left. It was not like an awkward thing. Mm-hmm. But it harmed us on a creative level because everyone from management and, and label pivoted. And now, before Panic came out, it wasn't you need to be like this kind of Fall Out Boy thing. Mm-hmm. We were very, very different than Fall Out Boy. Right. Some people don't maybe might not agree with that, but we were. I was there, I remember. <laughs> and our whole thing was very, very different. Panic's thing was unique but sonically Brendan sounded a lot like Patrick yeah and for the first time there was this thing that we were on the outside looking in instead of like we were this new poster child for the scene yeah all of a sudden the scene was this eyeliner theatrical and the scene was all the better and all the bigger for it Mm -hmm. but we didn't get it and that's why we made the Santi record the way that it was and like and you know that was kind of the end of our like trajectory and like that you know was a painful thing to go through as a band that being said like Brendan Yuri is one of the kindest people I know and every time I've hung out with him over the years regardless of how big things were going or how bad things were going because they had their moments where things weren't going so great mm. people left the band people had drug problems people had you know all the above that can go wrong in a band happened to them and that guy has been 100% the same person since the day I met him, which is really kind, family-oriented, keeps to himself, plays video games, <laughs> hangs out, nice to everybody, nice to his crew. And that's all I really look for. All right, y'all. Word. Well, that's basically all I have for you today. I hope you liked this video. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and and uh, and uh, hopefully this video was cool. And uh, I will see you all in the future. Peace out. Cozy representative squad. My people. Y'all are the real MVPs. I will see you very, very soon. Goodbye, y'all. God damn it, I'm fucking-